I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, most of you probably recognize our media star here, Keith Carson, who he was here in Portland for how long before you abandoned us yeah. to go to Three the Weather years. Channel? <laughs> But then, as soon as he got down there, he realized what he was missing, and he hightailed it back. And he is back at WCSH, and I had him come and speak at Colby with a bunch of students, and he was such a hit that I thought he'd be a great speaker to have him come here and talk a little bit about how you talk about climate change. So, with no more ado, here is Keith Carson. Right, thank you. Um, so, originally we were going to do something on how climate change impacts Maine, but two, two factors. One is um, we were selling a house and renovating another and I don't have time to make another talk. And two is I figure if you're here, you're already on board. So really what we need to do is talk about communicating with other uh, people who aren't on board because I think one of the bigger problems we have right now is the echo chamber effect of, of social media and, and, and how we conduct ourselves. We just hear things we want to hear over and over again. And so. Um, we know it's a problem, we know it's impacting Maine, and so to get into the nitty gritty of that, it may be fascinating, but probably doesn't really further the goal um, that much. So uh, what we're gonna do is gonna be kind of interesting and it's gonna depend on your eyesight. Um, I just wanna set this up, a lot of this is just talking points, so it's not like we're missing some great video of Todd Gutner riding a bull or anything like that, but there is, um, there is kind of a setup here that I want you to be able to see, so we're gonna pass. So I, I've subdivided all this into the players, talking points, and approaches. And so the players is what I'm gonna start with. These are the people that I've encountered, um, and I've talked to Gulf of Maine Research Institute about this, and people who teach uh, climatology, because they don't interact with the public that much. Mm -hmm. So it's this weird disconnect. Um, League of Conservation Voters, I talked to them too, because again, they don't, deal too much with people who are not on their side, so to speak. And so what are these people saying and who are they and how do they subdivide, I think is really important. I probably talked to a couple of thousand climate change skeptic, at least, uh, via Twitter, via Facebook. I had a couple of videos that went outside of Maine, you know, on the internet viral-wise, and so those people pour in, and so you talk to a lot of them. So you can subdivide them into a bunch of categories. Um, alarmed, this is, probably you guys. Um, they're all in on climate change. They, they know it's a huge issue and it needs to be addressed immediately. You've got on board, doesn't doubt the science, occasionally cares about it. So I think there's a lot of well-educated people that I'm friends with who are not going to argue climate change with you, but it's just not high on their, on their list. You know, it's not, um, it's not as immediate as some other things in their life and uh, they'll do stuff to help, but they're not going to advocate for it. It's just not, it's just not high. Huh? Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how people are in my backyard um, driven weather or climate. Um, and then skeptical truly believes the science is 50-50 and doesn't see how a man can have this much impact. This is, this is who we, we really need to target. Um, because I have run into a good amount of them. I run into them in live shots and Gardner and whatever. They'll say just off the cuff to me, yeah, but you know, wasn't, isn't it all cyclical? And, and I've been able to swing people, reasonably at least, who are in that camp, who really just haven't done research on it, and they believe that this is a 50-50, scientists are still fighting it out kind of debate. Um, and John Oliver does a great piece on climate change where he talks about part of the problem is when you do a TV show and you do a debate, you put one person on one side, you put one person on the other side. Mm -hmm. So no matter what the evidence is on this side, it looks like it's a 50-50 proposition. So he did what's called a, I think he called it a, a statistically representative climate change debate. And he put two people on one side of the table and 98 on the other side and let them just shout at them. <laughs> but, but there is a perception in TV about that. And we do, we do interviews like this at Channel 6 where we always have to say, should we even be debating this topic? Are we giving it too much breath on the other side when we shouldn't be? Um, if, it's, if it's kind of a settled thing. Um, so this is who we really need to target. And then you've got uh, Denier, which is just straight out. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. Does a lot of research of their own. Um, they will link and link and link on my pages. All this stuff, from none of which is, is peer reviewed or, or legitimate, but, but they just bombard you with information. And what's interesting about some of these guys, and they're almost all men, I'm sorry, um, is that, 
Yeah, there's, yeah there's, a, there's a demo here for sure. And not, not to say that I haven't run into some women on this, but it just seems like at least online it has been, it has been men more so. Um, they will go through pretty great lengths to learn quite a bit about the atmosphere just to try to argue about this, which is really, I think is really interesting. Like, we'll end up talking about, you know, how greenhouse gases work and what the half-life of methane is versus, I mean, they'll really, they really want this to not be a thing. And so they'll do a lot of their own digging to try to sound intelligent. And unfortunately, if you don't do this for a living, you might lose that debate. You know what I mean? I, I've caught a few of them in just totally thermodynamically incorrect statements, but is the average person gonna do that? Maybe not, and so they're just gonna bowl them over. Uh, so this person, you're gonna have a hard time with this. And then there's conspiracy theorists. So for them, it's not about climate change. Just everything is, is an illusion. So they're kind of like um, the flat earth, um, Moon trip yeah, the whole thing, right, exactly. So, so this is a whole different group here, and they, they just think the whole thing is some sort of intergovernmental um, hoax. And so, again, I'm not sure how much progress you're going to have with that. I'd still rather talk to this person than this person. But, um, but the skeptical, the one who truly believes that we're 50-50 on this is really, in my opinion, the person that you can uh, target. And so these are the talking points that you will hear over and over again. Um, it's a cycle. It's the sun, volcano, water vapor, um, a variety of things. CO2 is too small to impact. This one has been a, a, a pretty big problem because it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right that it's such a small part of our atmosphere and it can have such a big impact. And so um, there's a whole paper on, on talking to people about climate change and how the feelings of the argument just seem, they say, well, it's such a small percentage. How is it possible um, for it to have this kind of effect? So that, that is something I've run into a lot. The number one, no question, is it's a cycle. It's been cold before. It's been hot before. It doesn't matter that we're here. Um, so at its face, I get that. I get where they're coming from. But it's also, as I like to point out to people, it's insulting to the thousands of scientists who have studied this for so many years. Like, I'm so glad you thought of that. They never thought of that. You know what I mean? Like, the, they, oh, you've cracked the case. That's it. We're done. Um, so, but that's, that's really, really big. And so I have these, these different graphs that I have just saved on my phone that, it, that are always pointing out the rate of rise. And... Obviously, we've been through these cycles before, but right now we should be cooling, right? So we're a solar minimum. Um, we've got no factors that should be driving us up like this, and yet here we are. Uh, so that's one of the best things, and I like to let them walk into a trap if possible. And what I mean by that is I'll say, if it's not us, what is it? And then I wait for something. Sometimes they'll say volcanoes, which is one of my favorites because that's a cooling, a net cooling thing to the atmosphere. So sometimes you have to let them talk about it and say, okay, well, what do you think it is then? Um, and then you can, you can start a conversation. Um, online is, is tough to begin with, so in person these, these do a lot better. But, um, and then there's just, it's a hoax. I mean, if you get through all of this stuff, I have backed many a person into a corner to where they just say all the data you just presented is fake. And then, I mean, you just got to shrug your shoulders and, you know, I don't know, put my baby to bed and call it a day. I mean, what are you going to do? It's, there, there's, if you can go down these, these different talking points and, and try to talk sense into someone, but then they're just going to go back to, well, the data itself, the source of the data is corrupted. I mean, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, one of the biggest rises in denial groups I found is trying to pick apart the data from the, from the United States uh, ground observation and basically arguing that it had more to do with urbanization around these sensors than it does warming temperatures. Um, that's a really, really common one now. Um, and of course, we've, it's been controlled for, not to mention, we've been, mentioning, we've been measuring it since 1978 by a satellite. So it has, it's not like we're just reading thermometers around. Um, but these are the kind of things that, that you'll hear from a lot of different people. So what can we do about it? Um, it depends on your personality. The number one thing you can't do, and this is very hard, 
is you can't be condescending about it. There is no argument you will ever win, and you all know that, I'm sure, uh, by being condescending. And I think that's a, a big problem in, um, in a lot of, so the death of the expert that's been happening over the past couple of years, it's, I think it's about that. I think it's about people talking to other people like, like they're too dumb to understand it. And um, you just lose someone right away. They don't want to come over to your side if, if you make it seem like they're too dumb to, to you know, be here, so to speak. And so that's one of the hardest things to do, but I think it's one of the most important things to do. Forget about climate change, anything like that. You're not going to win people over by looking down your nose at them. I've heard some ridiculous statements that I, but I, I know to just to try to, to try to win them over because just making fun of it or, or having this certain scoff isn't going to get you anywhere. So I think that's a problem. Like I said, it's, the experts are being, a pro, being beat down in a lot of different areas. I mean, you look at doctors who are, who are trying to tell people what to do with their kids and vaccinations, and, and they want to go on YouTube and find a different source. And part of that is this just general, like, we know better, you don't. And, and it's true, but it, but it annoys people. Um, and so it, it, it's led to this whole counter movement of, I'll find my own sources. Um, and the internet has been a problem like that. I mean, I grew up with the internet. I was one of the first generations. But it's expanded to the point now where anything you want to be true, you just Google it and you find a source for it. So you know, if you find why climate change is a hoax, you'll, hit, you'll get millions of hits. Um, and that's what makes it more dangerous now. It can spread like that. But you can't, you've got to try to keep a level head. Where did I put that water? And, and, not, um, and not be condescending about it. That's where the whole East Coast elite idea came from. Um, what doesn't work? Scary stuff in general. Uh, your city will be underwater soon. We're past the point of no return. Even if that's true, it certainly doesn't inspire any action. Um, Cause then it's the, you shrug your shoulders. If your house is on fire and the whole thing is going down, you're not going to pour any water on it. So, um, and then weather becoming more extreme. And the reason I point this out is NBC Nightly News does it sometimes. They all, and it, and it makes me, my skin crawl a little, is anytime there's a severe weather event, they link it right to climate change. And, and certainly there is research that, that shows that precipitable water, for example, has increased in the atmosphere. That makes sense as the globe has gotten warmer. But careful because not every event we've ever had is linked to climate change. I mean, think about the hurricane in 1938 here in New England. I mean, if that, if that happened now, I'm sure the headline would be about that. And so you'll never see me in front of the green screen say, today was this because of climate change. I think the broader the scope you keep it in and the more data-driven you keep it in, the better. And, and trying to link individual events to it, I think, is really dicey because then when you have that snap in the middle of December that's 25 degrees below zero for a couple of days, you've opened the door for the conversation of if the globe is warming, how, why is this happening? So uh, I've always argued in big time spans from the late 1800s to now. I don't want to talk about these little undulations. I mean, there was a time from 1998 to 2012, they call it the pause, where we didn't warm a ton. Now, if you zoom the graph out, we're still going up. But we had these up and downs, and that's going to happen, and it could happen again. Uh, so if we tie it to these little small-scale weather events all the time, I think that's dangerous, because you're going to have a year without hurricanes or, or landfalling hurricanes. Or, and it's going to make people point and say, see, this isn't a problem. Um, I think that happened with Al Gore's movie years ago. Um, I think Al Gore meant well but probably was one of the worst things that ever happened to climate change because he was, he is a political figure. And so he was trying to do something good. But that was, if you think about the timeline, that was the turning point in which it became this politically tribal left-right thing. In 2008, John McCain ran on fixing global warming as a Republican presidential nominee. You cannot imagine that now, you know, 11 years later. And I think a lot of that came from it started with Al Gore's movie, and then all of a sudden it just somehow became this, this politically tribal uh, issue. So long story short, stay away from those individual scary things. I do think that sea level rise, especially in Maine, is something that we can talk to people about because they see it. Lobstermen are really interesting because 
a lot of them, they, they see it every day. And they, they don't try to attribute it usually. But they will say, hey, yeah, you know, the, the sea level's up here. I'm catching fish they used to catch down across southern New England. And I think that kind of stuff, fishermen are a great resource for us in Maine, lobstermen too, to use because they play to how Mainers, they respect that. They respect that whole trade. And to have them say, look, I'm seeing it here. It is happening. I think is worth 15 graphs with a professor pointing to it. Um, and so whenever we can use them, and I know that the League of Conservation Voters was kind of on to this with some of their, with some of their uh, ideas, um, and Union of Concerned Scientists as well. Those kind of figures are really helpful. Farmers too, they see it. I've noticed that, that northern Maine and the coast doesn't have that many climate skeptics. It's actually more places where they might they work and they don't work outside, but they also maybe didn't do a ton of research into it. That's, that's actually the most dangerous part of, of Maine as far as the denialism goes is, is just a little bit inland where you're not working with the land, you're not seeing it every day. So that doesn't work. It, it just makes people kind of cringe and it also means that if we have a year without big storms, you got some explaining to do. Um, and then this is, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, if you can let people walk into it a little bit as far as the arguments here, don't put words in their mouth. You know, here they'll say, uh, well, it was the sun. Well, here's a graph of total solar irradiance. It hasn't changed. That's the kind of method I think works a little bit better because if you just give them that right off the bat, they'll just pivot. You know, <laughs> well, here's the sun. Well, no, actually, I thought it was uh, warming from beneath. I've heard that a lot lately. The core of the earth is releasing more heat now is the idea. Um, so a lot of problems with that. But anyways, <laughs> you don't want to put those words in the mouth. Let them you know, kind of go down that road themselves and you'll end up in a better spot. Future tense, this is, this is uh, near and dear to my heart. This is why I almost always talk data records, how much we've warmed. I don't do too much with the computer models that project our climate because they've actually done, they've done all right within, within you know, what you'd expect. But us weathermen have a bad rap. And when you talk future like that, immediately they'll say, well, if you have a hard time seven days out, how could you possibly know what's going to happen you know, 30 years from now or whatever? Of course, you're, predicting, you're trying to predict different things and all that. And, um, and weather forecasting has come leaps and bounds. But, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still going to happen. We're still going to get beat sometimes on these storms. And so if we talk future all the time, they equate it to my 10-day day forecast. Well, so maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. You know. And so that's why I'm always trying to look into the past tense of where we've been um, in stocks and sports. It's un unpredictable in people's mind, the atmosphere. It's, it's too complex. So would you say chance of climate change tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm very... <laughs> I'm very afraid to, not afraid, I'm very reluctant to talk about projections of, of temperatures, you know what I mean? Um, it's more like it is happening now, it's a more solid, I think it's a more solid ground to stand on than to talk about how much we might warm. Because although some of the members have done well, in, there are a couple of really bad ones that have overdone it. And, and trust me, they found those. So um, it's just one of those things, I think, and we could easily have you know, another couple year pause on our way to, you know, plus four Celsius, but, but we don't know exactly how that's going to play out. Um, and you can't change people's mind on even the weather forecasting. I, we did this thing, Eric Fisher and I, he's down in Boston as chief at BZ. We tracked our forecast on rain, snow calls, and then temperatures within the seven day period. And we found that our, our calls were 71% right seven days out. They, I mean, when Joe Kubo started, they would have killed for that. Like, it's, it's rapidly advancing. The, the two-day forecast is equivalent to the five-day forecast 15 years ago. I mean, the speed of which, but it doesn't matter. It's still weather, and it's still in my backyard. I got eight inches, and you said it was going to be 10. So, so the future is just, you know, people think of it as being too predictable, un unpredictable to... Uh, to really talk about. Now I have gone on, I've done several segments on climate change at, at our station at NBC and, and, um, and I have not had any problems with it, but I'm always talking, like I said, I'm always talking in the, the long term. I did a whole segment on the real danger of climate change denial is 
really just the denial of, of the scientific method. You know, um, when I look at this, I think there are, there's, I think there are chances that, that we get lucky environmentally before we ruin the whole earth with this. I mean, this will, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of oscillations that we might get lucky with that could cool us down. But my problem with it, really at its core, is that all of this research has been done really since the 1950s, or before that if you want to talk about the early look at it. But, and people are just saying, no, like that's not real. And that is, to me, that's really the scary part of all of this because so much of what we've accomplished <laughs> as people has been because of this method and this way of saying, okay, we're, we're progressing along these lines and, and to have people in this day and age look at this huge body of research and, and it's, I think it's about 40 something percent of the country just says, nope, it's not, it's not happening. And, and if it is, it's not us, even though we've proven it's us. So that to me is really what got me into this, into this game. Now, as far as what you're allowed to do, uh, I was saying earlier, I, I haven't asked. I, I just, I have done it. Um, you don't see it a lot, and I think part of that is not station policy, but meteorologists themselves who don't want to be bombarded by people. Um, I mean, I've had some really, some really quite violent stuff thrown my way when I've gone out after climate change, and it's not usually from Maine. It's usually, I mean, the internet circulates the way it does, and I, you know, I have a video like that that has a hundred thousand views on it. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, so I think it's actually more that they just but you could also do it don't want to. I want to say I saw MTW or no Channel, Channel 13 I think did something on did did a climate change segment but it was mainly about what it means for Maine and the guys at GMRI um, Gulf of Maine Research Institute are great at that they convey like what what this is about but you're right I mean I'd say in general people aren't jumping into the fray and they're especially not jumping into the fray in places where they know it's not popular to to do so. You know, I mean, if I went down into in some parts of this country and started talking about this, I might, I might end up in the, the office. I'm not sure. I think every station has their own policy, um, you know, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, it's a business. And so, you know, uh, the truth is the most important thing, but there is a point in which you, they're trying not to lose customers. And I think a lot of meteorologists have the same problem. They don't want to lose fans, you know. They don't want to lose people. Uh, and, I've, you know, I've probably lost a few going after this, but I think most of it is, um, is at this time, right now, is political tribalism. I, I think, I mean, I can't, you know, and I've always said to people, I don't, I, do, I truly don't care how you vote. That's not, that's not anything to do with what I do. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of what I get as far as climate skeptic, it just tends to be that way. And I think that's what it is right now. I think even if there's no research being done and you happen to be, you happen to lean that way politically, you're just gonna, you're just gonna say no to it. It's just, just one of those issues. Um, and that's why I spoke about Al Gore. It's done, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have a political problem with him. However, I think he made it a side thing. And, and, and to dig out of that. The other side of it is that he really convinced a lot of people. He did, too, he did. So, so it's interesting, like I don't know what would have happened without him. I can't say how that would have gone down. Um, but I know that we're one of the most divided countries in the world about it. And so, you know, in, in, even in places where they're spewing stuff in the atmosphere, there's not as much denial about it. They just don't care, <laughs> you know, and, and so there's that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's no way to run it in tandem. I just, he's brought up to me a lot, is all I can say. Like, your Reverend Al Gore is, the, you know, it, it, so it's this thing like, he's, he's this, therefore you are this because you agree with him. You know, and I've actually never see, even seen Inconvenient Truth. I, you know, I, it's never been up my realm of things because at the time I was in college learning this stuff anyway, so I didn't need to watch it. But we're like in, in the Twitter's world mind, we're on the same team. And, and that's where I think it gets tough. And airplanes. So this is something that we just talked about the other day. And this is thrown in people's face, and I think fairly so. There are a lot of people who are, who are big on being green, and they travel a lot. And look, I love traveling. I think it's, it's one of the, the great things to do in life. However, going carless for a year saves roughly two tons or so of CO2, and a transatlantic flight here and back is about two tons of CO2. So it's almost equivalent to skip one to Europe and back trip as it is to just walk to work every day. And so, 
I think that's something that there's a lot of people who are, who are green in intention, and they do these things, like their house is super green and all that, um, but maybe they're not living it all the way around. And nobody's perfect, mm -hmm. but you know, I walked to work for a couple of years, and thank God, because you know how many times people said, so I assume you walk to work every day? And I, I said, yeah, I do. And they're like, ooh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like just perfect. Um, they walked into it. Now that I'm moving, and I don't know, I'm gonna have to think of something. I'm gonna have to bike or something. But, um, but so Al Gore and, and even um, someone like Bernie Sanders, they get ripped apart quite a bit, at least in the circles I'm in, because yes, they're trying to help and they're trying to reach the masses, but they're also flying around on a private, private jet. And to ignore that is unfair. You know, and I understand it's modern travel, and again, I've, I've traveled. Um, but you know, people, people want to see they want you to see, if you're this concerned about it, then all of these speeches should be teleconference, or they should all be, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio was another one, big, big advocate for climate change, which I think is good, it gets into a different space, but he has a private jet and a yacht, and, and uh, you know, I think that's hard for people to reconcile those two things. Um, so when you're, when you're talking to people, you have to let them save face. You can't, there's no argument or debate or negotiation that you can just drive someone into a corner and have that work out. Um, there's a book my dad made me read years ago called Win-Win Negotiation. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. So my, my dad ran a company down in Massachusetts and there's this book, and I guess they used to give it to a lot of salesmen. It, I think it was maybe from the 60s or mid 60s. The, the whole premise of it though was that it was this. You, the, the point of it is for you to both think you won because that's how you get the deal done. If someone goes in there and just tries to, to, to ram it down your throat, no, nobody wants that. Everybody backs away from it. So now we can't, we can't give people the out of not believing in climate change. But what you can do is, is soften when you're talking about it. For example, I'll, when someone says it's cyclical, I'll say, well, most people don't realize this. Like you're not alone, but. And, and then hit them with how it really works. Or sometimes in rural areas when I've talked to Mainers about it, I go back on this line, which is, I'm not telling you specifically what to do about it, but I'm telling you the science behind it is sound. And process that, and then maybe in a couple of years, they'll come back and say, all right, well, maybe I want to do something about it. But I'm not going to get someone to believe in climate change, ditch their F-350 in the same day. It's just not going to happen. So it has to be sequential so they feel like they are coming to it. You are not telling them what to do. Um, I think that's really, really big. I mean, I've got a friend who, who is the F-350 super duty guy. He builds coal power plants in Central America. Okay? And, and somehow we're friends. It's amazing. But what I've done is I've, I've worked on him slowly about, about what's really happening. And I don't know if I can take credit for this or not, but he recently quit his job and he's now gonna be a realtor over here. So I'm like, I don't know, it probably wasn't me, but I, I worked on him slowly. There's no way I could go into that friendship and be like, what are you doing? You know, it's just, it, we wouldn't be friends and then I'd have no voice. Um, so I think giving people these incremental ideas, uh, it seems to help. Another thing is, you talk about saving energy, saving money, Let's make those, the more we can make those go together, the better. Like, heat pumps are great, right? Mm -hmm. People are getting them in droves. It's not because they want to save the environment in general. It's because it saves a ton of money and they work great. Um, so the more technology we have where it's not mutually exclusive, oh, you got to drive this electric car, but it only goes 150 miles. You know, that kind of stuff. The, as technology advances, I think that helps us a lot because it's not a choice about the environment or the product, you can get both in one. I mean, these uh, heat pump guys, they're booked out for five months. Again, they're not all people who are like, I want to stop using oil. They want to save money, you know? Um, and so the more technology that comes about like that, that's win-win, the better. Because now you're not making people, yeah, it's great if you want to sacrifice, but most people are going to think in terms of their day-to-day -day life. Um, and if you can't make it better for them, if you're just asking them just to sacrifice, that's a harder sell. But if you can say, well, you can get these, save money, and help the environment, um, that's great. Was it Union Concerned Scientists that did, they did um, what's called dial testing? You get, is anyone familiar with that? So they use it in TV. Basically, they show you an ad, a show, or whatever, and you've got a dial. And the baseline is neutral. 
And as soon as you see something you like, you turn it up. And when you see something you don't like, you turn it down. And it, and it just it gives you this great line graph in correlation with the video. So when they see me, they turn it way down. Everyone knows nobody <laughs> likes me. So they did this with a couple of ads. And it was about efficiency of your, your home, about getting your home insulated. And they ran these two ads. And the first one was like, it's great. It saved me so much money. And efficiency main gives me rebates, blah, blah. And people were like, so they divide them by political groups because they felt like that was a good idea. So they had independent, a Democratic, Republican. So everybody's going up. They like it. They like it. And it just kind of stays that way. It's positive, 75% positive. They did the same ad. And in it, she says, and it's also great because I'm helping out with climate change. When she says that word, the, the red line goes almost to zero. Um, the point of that was, in that case, did, you need, did it even help you to mention it? Or should you just get people to, to insulate their houses, save energy, and everybody's good? Yes? Uh, did, was that true across the demographics? No. Um, it's kind of what you'd expect. So the blue line for, for um, the Democratic self-identifying didn't change. It just stayed positive. The independent dipped a little. Um, but it was really the red line that just went. And what year was that? This was last year? This okay. year? Yeah, so it's very recent. Um, Thank you. I thought that was really enlightening um, just to see trigger words. And of course, ironically, it was changed from global warming to chi climate change because they found climate, uh, global warming was too political. Uh, well, what we're learning is it doesn't matter what we call it. So we probably should just stick with one now. Um, but that was kind of a microcosm of my approach of it is let's get people to do the environmentally friendly thing, but it's not always going to be a case of um, your motives being the same as their motives, and I think that's OK. Um, I tossed the idea out in front of a, a panel one time that got me some interesting looks of, is it possible we should spend more time back on the pollution argument? Because I don't know anybody who likes pollution. Pollution, like talking about, let's, because all these coal, I mean, natural gas is cleaner, but it's not clean. You know, that, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a farce that the natural gas is clean. It's better, but it's not. The idea of like, maybe we should spend more time on this, the fossil fuels are polluting, and this is a problem, and nobody wants that for the kids, and blah, blah, blah. And then along the way, yeah. we're lowering emissions and ultimately winning the war instead of the battle. Um, I don't know, the, the, they didn't go for it. But I, it was just a thought I had of like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce emissions and, and save the planet. Does it matter if we get to say we're right? Or should we just do it the way that works? And I think pollution, a lot of even climate change deniers will say to me, look, you know, I'm not a fan of fossil fuels. They pollute and they're bad. But, and, and so it, it kind of, even that baseline works with most people who are climate change deniers. The idea that, yeah, we probably shouldn't be relying upon this for a number of reasons in the future. Um, so I almost wonder if like, there's a pivot ahead here at some point where you have to say, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like we're just going in the opposite directions. But the come together move might be, nobody wants their kids breathing this. It's, it's just obviously bad in general. And we're going to run out of it. So maybe we should fix this problem. Yeah, but High rates of bad. Right. I mean, I lived in Atlanta for a while. And you get an o ozone yeah. day down there, and it was, uh, you know, you could see it. You'd fly into the airport and just see it sitting. Right. Well, I actually think that's the best skill you can have right now with this, or really a lot of things, is, is letting people be upset and not matching that energy. Um, even if you don't convince them, you'll convince them that you're a, a decent person. So what I find is that online is a lot different than in person, especially for me, because in person, people, some people kind of know me. So I very rarely have gotten people who have come up to me and argued climate change to my face. Right. Like it's, it's uh, you know, and, and so this is a tactic I tried for a while and then I realized it was too adversarial so I dropped it. Is sometimes I get these people online and they'd be throwing all these links at me and I said, why don't you come into the studio and we'll, we'll debate climate change, no Google, we'll just sit down. And no one would show up, of course. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to say to them was, do you really know anything about this or do you, are you just looking things up? But, but it was too adversarial, and so I, th I think what you're, the best thing you can do, it's hard to make other, some people care about other people, right? And so somebody brought up gun control. That, that is a good example. I mean, do you think anybody likes watching on TV, seeing kids? I mean, most people at some point have kids. Yeah. 
And they should be able to feel what that feels like. But it doesn't always work that way. And so I think they either have to be impacted by the natural disaster themselves, um, or I think the better thing is if you can weather their anger, it does typically bring it down. If it doesn't, after 20 minutes, then you're probably never going to get there. You know? No, I mean, I think we're in the same page. Like I said, it's, and it's incremental. I don't think, like, I think all of this, all of this is a negotiation whether or not we like it. We know we're right, but it doesn't change the, it doesn't change how we have to get there. And so just shoving it down people's, and I have some concerns about how it's stream, it's getting on, on every side, on each side. Um, you know, because I think it's the more, the more one side shouts about the, that the world's going to end in a couple of years, the more the other side says this is a bunch of crap. And so it, we just we're not coming, we're not getting there. Um, and so everybody's trying to win outright. And I just I think that there's no question, of course, that that we are the cause of this warming. But if we keep pushing in polar stratified directions. Well, how are we going to resolve it? How are we going to get there? Luckily, other countries are doing it, and we're still doing it. Our emissions are down quite a bit. Now, per capita, we're terrible. And that's, and that's something I've talked to people. Often I'll, I'll meet guys mm -hmm. in construction or something who will say, yeah, but like, look what China's doing. I said, yeah, but they also have way more people than us. Mm -hmm. So, But per capita, I think we're second yeah. in the world. And I forget who's number one. I don't know if it depends. So Pew Research has done a few of these, and I think it's gone, actually kind of gone in the wrong direction recently, but what's interesting is it's stratified within political beliefs beyond what you would think. So younger, more conservative people believe in it at a much higher rate than older conservative people. So it's actually, in general, dragging that party upward, but there was not much debate about it even, not no, no, no debate, it wasn't as much stratification about it even in the 2007, 2008 range. That's, I, I, wasn't, I never gave these talks before because it didn't need to. Everybody was, not everybody, it was just kind of an accepted thing. Hey, we got to fix this. And, and then somewhere along the lines, it became this very divisive um, thing. And that's when I decided to jump into the, the ring is uh, to try to bring it down. But yeah, I mean, I think um, most people who, the first step is getting them to believe the science is sound. And then I think everything else follows relatively naturally. But you can't make it financially excruciating for people. And I think that's the thing. It's like everybody's got their own life and their own backyard. And if you make it too hard for them to do the right thing, it, it, it doesn't always happen. And so um, those are those borderline people, the 50-50 people. Like I said, they'll, they'll put the heat pumps in, but don't make it cost more money. And that, that's kind of, um, and luckily our technology is, is advancing relatively quickly. That's the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is I mentioned the world's going to end in X number of years. And um, as I said, I have, no, I have no interest in how people vote. I do have a problem with some of these headlines that come out on both sides of politicians that don't put it in context or don't. And they're, they're just ammunition. Um, you know, the idea that um, the 12-year thing that, that was so widely spread, that the, the world's going to end in 12 years if we don't fix this. Of course, the, what the point was trying to be made was this is the last possible tipping point, most likely, for us to fix this. But that's not what came out. And that's not what's, what was sound, you know, the sound bite. And so you know, my, my Twitter in the days and weeks following that was people saying, oh, so the world's going to end in 12 years. I'll check back with you in 12 years. You know, and, and so these are the sound bites that are so, so dangerous on both sides. A guy going into Congress, look, it's a snowball. There's no climate change. You know, like, it, and it's not, it's not one-sided. It's not one-sided. There are people speaking out of turn on the left and the right who don't know what they're talking about. And I think that's very, very dangerous. Like You might have the right intention, but to put it out of context, let, let the scientists do the science. <laughs> Policy is very important, but you've got to be careful because those kind of soundbites live forever. Like Al Gore's, um, he had some famous one about New York City that didn't play out and that lives on on the, on the internet because he was wrong at the time. No, the scientists did not believe that was the consensus. It doesn't matter, though. That's where it is. And so, you know, mark my words, if Twitter still exists in 12 years, people will say, I thought the world was going to end in 12 years. Um, so, but, you know, like I said, both sides need to just watch their sound bites, you know, because that's all that comes out. It doesn't matter if you talk for an hour and they get that one that, that out of context doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, hurts, it hurts the whole cause. Just have one more point and then any questions? 
we have? Um, oh, small dose science. So this is something I learned in meteorology too. My first job in meteorology, I would get up on TV, it's Burlington, Vermont, and I'm talking about deformation zones, which is where air stretches in a storm. And my news director comes down and uh, goes, don't ever say that on TV again. Like, if you can't explain that in 30 seconds, do not say it. And so that's kind of true with some of this science, too. If you can't nugget it down, you're going to lose people. Um, and sources are important, especially online. And this is crazy but true. It's best if the sources are not even from the United States, British, Canadian. It, it, it makes people... Try to link somebody who, who is a climate change denier to something from CNN. It's not going to work out. It doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. Um, so you've got to have these sources that are, that are outside the realm of what they believe to be biased um, media. Often I just link them directly to the paper, and I'm sure nobody has ever read a paper that I've linked, but at least it... It, it goes right to the source, but yeah, if you try to use you know CNN, NBC, any of the any of the major ones, um, they're just gonna, they're not even going to look at it. They're just going to say, well, that's from whatever. I like I actually like NASA a little bit for a number of reasons. One of which is if you're politically tribal about it, you can point out that currently the administration is on your side, and look, it's still on their website. It's still and they do pretty good, you know, half to one page um, dives on it. Um, there's also a site called Skeptical Science that's really good. That's actually a good site to learn. He's got these top 10 denier myths. And you just click through them and he's got three levels. It's basic, <coughs> intermediate, and in-depth. And so you can learn as much about it as, as you'd like to. What's that? Um, Skeptical Science. It's, a, it's really good because like I said, he's seen it all and he just kind of lays out the different um, rebuttal points for each one of those. Um, but yeah, the source is really important. Um, I've seen that a lot in our job. I mean, you know, Pat and, and these other ankles will tell you they've never seen a, quite a time quite like this as far as people just outright saying whatever you're saying is not true. Um, luckily, at the local level, we've kept trust research-wise at a much higher level. You know, when they've done, when they do studies on this, local news is far beyond cable and network as far as trust level. And I think it's partially personalities and, and people they've known for a while. Um, so we have an opportunity to change some knives because I don't think people look at uh, Channel 6 the same way they look at Nightly News or, or CNN or whatever. Because these are people they've seen. Pat's been there forever. Cindy's been there forever. Are they suddenly just making stuff up? You know? And I think we can leverage that and use that uh, positively. But yeah, sources are always, whenever I can, I find one from Fox News, if I can. I will find one from, from that, for what they, they feel is the most credible source. There are, there are actually occasions where they'll do a story on it, and it's kind of inadvertent almost. It's about a, a catastrophe that was from climate change. Or, <coughs> and you can use that, and that's really one of the best um, sources to use if, if possible. Um, but I, I just that's where we are. People will stonewall sources that they think are, are biased. Yeah, so NPR is great. Again, when they, when they do this polling, um, a certain percentage of the country feels NPR is left biased. Yeah. And so linking for is, is, they believe it is left biased. And so they're, they're, they're one of those sources that is one, they're one of my favorites. They're like one of the few news websites, because I usually know what's going on just from being there, but they're one of the few websites I will go to that and 538 um, statistical analysis is one of my favorites too. But, but to the group we're trying to reach, it is still seen as, as a left-leaning organization. And so um, it's great for my purposes. I don't typically link out from them because people kind of jump on that. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I think, so I get this a lot. Weather's one of the few times you can have fun on the entire newscast, and this is what happens. And so the same thing happens. I like to ski. And if we get a storm and I'm excited about it, emails. Well, I have to shovel my driveway. I'm in Machias. OK, I understand that. But like, we're also people. And so sometimes our own interests do get in there. I think as long as you're equal opportunity about it. Like, I don't think you have any business being a weather person up here and only loving the heat and hating the winter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's going to be a long year. I take each, <laughs> I take each season in, it, in stride here because it is what it is. And if you don't love them all, 
it, it can, it, you know, I mean, look at, look at this, this May. I mean, this is like, you know, it, this is not, nobody writes, it's not a postcard time from, from Maine right now, you know. Uh, I do understand what you're saying. I just think it's one of the few moments where they can have fun in the newscast. Um, and so to be serious through the whole thing, you know, I think it would be tough on our on ratings too, you know, <laughs> entertainment wise. I think you can, and I think I've proven that in that I've sometimes kept track of things like if I put a climate change video on Facebook, I look to see the next day how many people did I lose, how many people left the page because they don't want to hear this. And surprisingly, it's it's very minimal, and sometimes it goes the other way because people say, well, good, good, he went, he went after this. Or, um, so I think there is an opportunity in, in local news. The problem is it's not going to be something that stations dictate most likely because that's just not been the way that they've ever covered stories where they say you have to talk more about this or that. Um, so it's got to be individual. And so that's why I went and talked to these 500 kids who are about to graduate as meteorologists because they're like the next line that I want to go out there and start and, and do what I'm doing. Now, if they end up, you know, in Alabama, the first job doing weekends, they might have a hard time doing this. Some of it has to do with your brand, too. You know, when I came back, I had enough people who liked me that I could get away, get away with it in a way, and, I wouldn't, and nobody would come to me and say, you should probably stop doing this, or, or you know, people are upset about this. Because we get some, like I said, we, get, we had people threaten to sue our, our station over a climate change thing I did. I, you know, crazy. But, but they stood by me, I think, one, because they have the right values, but two, because they felt like I was enough of an entity in this market that they could, they could stand by me and say, you know, but th that next line of TV meteorologists, I think, is important because they can help. On a, any given day, it might be the only scientist people watch of any kind, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so th it's, it's unfortunately fallen on our shoulders, even though it's really not totally what we do. You know, we have atmospheric science degrees, not climatology. Um, we're second in line for understanding this, but, but we're more visible. Like, there's a guy, Andrew Pershing, down at uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. He's great. He knows so much, but people don't see him. It doesn't matter, you know? He puts out these reports, these PDFs, and then, eh, all right, you know, it's a press release. I've had him on a few times. He's really good, but if I don't get him on TV, nobody sees it, you know? And so it's really about communicating that way. So meteorologists, I think, are, are really important. And there's a whole group that started called um, Climate Matters that all they do is make graphics about climate change individualized by, individualized by market to send to TV meteorologists because they realize disseminating it this way might be a good way to get people to turn. So I don't usually use their graphs, but sometimes they'll give me a good idea to do a segment on, you know? Just because I like to have my own stuff. I don't like to use other people's data and, and all that. But I think it's a good front line for sure. I don't think we can, if we change it, I don't think it's going to matter. In fact, people who are uh, skeptics will point out that it changed because they think because it didn't warm fast enough. So I've heard that so many times. You had to change it from global warming to climate change because it wasn't warming anymore. So I actually think it was a mistake to change it, but um, nobody asked me. So it is what it is now. Uh, I think we're better off just staying with climate change and riding that out. I like global warming a little bit better because that is the problem. Yes, there are a lot of things that come off of that. But I liked it because it, it was our original premise and it is happening. I would have kept driving that direction, but again, um, the research they did said this is too politically tribal of a word, so we need to change this phrase. And then they changed it, and it became, you know, it is what it is. You can call it whatever you want. Um, it's you can call a Tesla an F three fifty. You know, carpenters aren't going to buy it all of a sudden. And so I think we're trying to change the name. Isn't going to happen. Isn't going to change anything. Um, people who are skeptics almost always call it global warming. Uh, ninety percent, ninety percent of the time. They'll come at me and say, well, global warming was supposed to do this. Or if climate ch saying climate change is almost like saying I accept it. So they'll usually say global warming. Mm -hmm. I, know it's gonna, I know what the conversation is going to be like if they start like that, I guess, is the best way to put it. Have you ever know? climate crisis? No. But if I did, I'd know I'm in good shape. You know? yeah. uh, and so I've started doing some like Elks Club talks and Rotary Club where I well, but it's not about climate change, but then it becomes about climate change. Because I think that's like, we started this conversation about echo chambers. And so if I talk to a bunch of people who are on board, I can help, 
but really I need to get people who aren't on board. So I'll go and do a talk, and we'll talk about Maine weather for 20 minutes, and then I'll be like, guess what? Climate change, didn't tell you about this. And it's good, because I'll get 50, 60 people in a room, and I just, I'll kind of scan, and by the reactions, I can tell 30 of them are not on board. But I think that's good. I think they wouldn't have come to a change by a talk by me about climate change. So if I can get them there to talk about local weather, and then shift gears, it's a bit of a bait and switch, but I do talk about the weather as well. Um, I think that works really well. And they, they've invited me back. It's not like they're like, don't ever come back here again. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, it, it, it tends to, uh, it's, it's become my new, Todd calls it the Trojan horse, uh, you know, <laughs> approach, where we come in and we talk about it and then we, you know, shift over. But it gives, it, it's, it's new people. It's people who are not already on your side. Um, it's less comfortable, but I think it's more impactful probably. You know? In the short term, yes. So methane is, is more powerful of a greenhouse gas than CO2, but it does not stay in the atmosphere nearly as long. And so it's important. If you want to drop it quickly, methane would be a good way to do it. But CO2 is the bigger threat because it's accumulating in the atmosphere. And so uh, there's a movie called Cowspiracy. It's about how beef is the real problem. And it's interesting because it's, it's half correct. The agriculture, all the support necessary to raise cattle is the, is the problem there. You're taking out so many trees and these carbon sinks. The methane that comes out of a cow is actually part of the natural cycle of carbon to begin with. So that cow got that from grass. And if they hadn't eaten it and then <laughs> farted it out, they would, the, the grass or the plant would eventually die and release that anyways. So that's actually, I thought that was a, interesting. It's a two hour documentary and I'm like, but you missed the carbon cycle. <laughs> However, the footprint of beef is huge because of the other factors that are necessary to raise cattle. Um, so that's, that's interesting. You'll see some of these documentaries are funny because they're like, they have got the right intentions, but you wish they had asked a few more people along the way. Um, you know, because I watched it and I thought it was really good. And the, the message is still correct, which is if we can reduce our impact or amount of meat we eat, we will take down CO2. But methane, yeah, I mean, it's a short-term solution, but it, CO2 is the problem because we can't get it out of the atmosphere. Um, and, we, and I've always said, like, we know how to warm the atmosphere up again if we need to, but we don't really know how to cool it down yet. And that's, you know, we, they're experimenting a little bit with what some people think has been going on for years with chem, chemtrails. I'm not sure if you've heard yeah. of So, but they, I mean, they've started thinking about, well, can we, can we go and put aerosols into the yeah. atmosphere and reflect the light back? But I don't know that these are games we want to be playing. I think the, the atmosphere is too complex to, to be messing around with this stuff. Um, but they're looking for backup plans because we're not sure if we're going to fix it in time. It's not looking great. Um, Hasn't the, um, there have been events where the, the explosion of a volcano yeah. has cooled a, mm -hmm. whole, a large section of the Earth? 1816, time. year without summer. Um, we just talked about it, actually, because it's... Baldwin apple trees in Maine. Yeah, and it's right. I didn't know that. That's yeah. interesting. What was that? What about it? 1816, yeah. Maine, Maine grew a variety of apple called Baldwins, and that summer or that year was too cold for them, and they didn't survive. And that changed the apple industry in Maine permanently. 1816, they had eight days with below freezing lows in June in Maine. Um, it was a volcano in Indonesia. Don't quote me on this because of the tea. No, it wasn't Krakatoa. It was, it was like Tam, Tambo or something. Yeah. Yeah, and it so yep, it had is it had a ton of um, ejected a ton of particulate. Some of it settled, but the rest of it was carried into more poleward regions, and um, and the global temperature dropped 0.7 degrees Celsius in one year, that which is crazy if you think about what we're talking about for this this span with with climate change. Does that um, affect CO2 also? Um, a little bit, but. It, it's, more of a, it's more of cooling simply by not allowing the sun in. That's the main thing. That's why I said there's a chance we'll get bailed out by Mother Nature. Like, not, that's not really how we want to do it because there's problems with agriculture and whatnot. But if you had a massive eruption, you know, two years in a row, you could lose a degree Celsius on the global temperature. Of course, if it didn't sit up there long enough, it would just go back to where it was before because you're not getting rid of the CO2. Um, yeah, there's some things we'll never recover.
But I think the best way to talk to most people about it, though, is, is a cost-benefit analysis of, like, we've got all these cities along the coastline. Okay, so eventually, I think we can survive. I think we're a pretty smart species. I think we could survive a plus four, plus five world, you know, by adapting with technology. However, we've built our infrastructure already. And a lot of it is along the coastline, especially in this country. So what, let's think about this. Is it, co is it better to bite the bullet a little bit now with increased energy costs in some cases for cleaner? Or do we want to move these cities? You know, or do we want to prop them up? Or do we want to rebuild stuff? And, and, and that's something I don't think gets enough attention, is let's talk to people about dollars and cents. You know, doesn't, like, that's how the military thinks about it. They, they famously have climate change in their papers an administration that is not a fan of climate change, but they're trying to protect the bottom line. Mm -hmm. They're saying, okay, Norfolk, Virginia, we got a plan because this, this water is gonna be here. Mm -hmm. So when it comes down to money, all of a sudden everybody's a believer. So I think that, th I've talked to Climate Central about this. Let's get some graphics about what it's gonna cost to move, you know, prop up these cities, build walls, sea walls in Boston, New York City, all these places that were backfilled, or what does it cost for us to just stop doing this? Um, because that usually works. Money usually works, you know? People being displaced. I mean, again, unfortunately, you're asking people to care about other people. And I think it, it's like that's, that's something you either have or you don't have. Um, and if you don't have it, it, it doesn't matter what, what you – I guess I'm a realist when it comes to that. Like, tell, <laughs> tell people how, why it makes more sense to do it this way. Um, and then you don't even have to win them over on the argument. You just have to say, it's going to cost us – $58 billion to build the Chesapeake Bay this way, or we can cut carbon emissions and subsidize solar, and it will cost us $20 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? Every, then everybody wins. Um, yeah. But I don't know. Nobody's really gone after that. It speaks to the Republicans. I mean, that's, well, I mean, I, everybody likes to save money, right? But, but certainly, that's been a core value mm -hmm. of conservative is uh, let's, let's try to save money. Let's, you know. Yeah. So if we can do that, then... <laughs> That would be a great topic yeah. for the Planet Money podcast. Yeah. Uh, Planet Money? Yeah, do you ever listen to that one? It's no. a good one. I don't drive enough to do oh, podcasts yeah, yeah, yet. Yeah. Don't forget. <laughs> you didn't listen on the bus. But I'm going to have to start biking bike. now. Yeah. So. That's a good podcast, but they might. That sounds like something they could tackle. Yeah, I, I've, I've not seen it. I asked the director of Climate Central about that. Have you seen any analysis? Or another analysis I asked for was number of doctors who believe that um, smoking doesn't cause cancer because they're out there mm -hmm. so there there are there are qualified scientists who are climate deniers and they and I can name a lot of them by name because they keep getting linked at me by mm -hmm. deniers and I always say well there's gonna be five or ten people who are qualified mm -hmm. in something who are just wrong and there are doctors out there who are gonna who are gonna tell you that smoking doesn't cause cancer but you probably think that it does so so that's another graphic I'd love to see like 99 point whatever percent of doctors uh, you know, believe this, but the, there are some here that don't. Um, who do, what side do you want to? What side do you want to be on in this yeah. argument? You know. Well, and people just don't think it through. I mean, I watched one of those real estate shows, and this guy was showing this new development in Miami. And he's like, "Oh, and you don't have to worry about it because it's all built on posts. It's all up here, so you know, climate change is not going to be a problem for you. The water can't reach you." I'm like, well, sure, but you're not going to be able to leave your house without a boat. Right. You know, but they don't think about that. And he's, well, he's pitching this on television to these people. And you won't like, have sewer or water. Here. Waterfront is a problem. Um, we, yeah. did, we did a story about flood insurance, how it's nationally oh, subsidized. Yeah. And I met with the, the director of FEMA in Maine, and she was basically saying, when the government got into it, it's because we assumed, eventually, people would stop building in places yeah. that oh, yeah, they yeah. get knocked down by water. We were wrong, and so some of these have been built famously 10, 15 times over and over again, and, and ultimately it is subsidized by the government uh, because no private insurance will take on that risk. And, of course, my argument is... Stop. Yeah, make them take on the risk. Say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll replace it. For any <laughs> cost... The value of replacement, but it has to be somewhere else. Right, exactly. Yeah, I don't want people... There are people who have inherited ocean house that don't have a lot of money, I mean, or, or long rivers that flood. You're right, so rebuild them somewhere else or make them, private insurance will get into the game for the right price. Yeah. There is no asset they won't insure for the right price. But if it's prohibitively expensive, maybe people will rethink it. And not to say you shouldn't be able to live along the water, but there are smart ones that are already, there, some that are already there might get washed away eventually, okay, versus building right there when you know what's happening 
you know, like Whole, Whole Foods down here is an example of that. Exactly. Where, yes. yeah. le, hey, like, spoiler alert, that floods all the time. 